Retro Tea Breaks is supported by Fusion Gaming Magazine. In this month's edition, today's guest shares his memories on the development of cannon fodder, and I reminisce about Computer Expo memories. The magazine fuses retro with modern, indie, and even tabletop gaming, perfect for your own retro tea break, or impressing the kids with your up-to-date gaming knowledge. Visit FusionGamingMag.com to order your copy, or click the link in the video description. Our guest today is a British artist who put together the pixels that every single Amiga fan will recognise, whether it be the players in Sensible Soccer or the soldiers in Cannon Fodder. And he's a man who I've had the pleasure of interviewing before in the new series of Retro Island Diskettes. Link in the description, go and check it out. It's former Sensible Software man, Stu Cambridge. Welcome, Stu. Hello. (laughs) Thanks for joining us, Stu. Um, Stu, as I understand it, before you had anything to do with Sensible Software... You were just like the rest of us. You were a, a huge Sensi fan, is that correct? Oh, that is that is spot on. I was a huge, huge fan of Sensible, and I used to play all their games. I had all their all their sixty four games. Just, uh, even the even the obscure ones like Ono oh and uh, Galaxy Birds, and what was the other? They did another one, another budget one. Um, yeah, I was a big, big fan. Yeah, big, big fan. I can't remember the the other budget ones, but Wizball was certainly a big one, and then. <laughs> Later uh, on, they had MicroPros Soccer, didn't they? Um, so, did you go out of your way to pick Sensi games off, off the shelves when they were out? I did. I, I, I was an avid reader of, of Zap sixty four, like a lot of sixty four users were, um, and I I would eagerly await the next issue. And as soon as you'd see a game coming up from Sensible, you'd be like, right, that's that's on my that's on my save up for for the next you know for the next purchase list. And uh, and if I didn't have enough money, I'd sort of you know say to my mum, I'll go on. Lend us a couple of weeks. <laughs> I wash the car, yeah. In fact, I can see your your Zap sixty four poster behind you there. So yes, still yes. a fan, yeah. Um, and it was with one of Sensible's own programs, Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit, that you got the opportunity to buy your dream computer and progress your career. Tell us about that, Steve. That's correct. Yeah, I I, I got hold of the uh, Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit, and originally it was just to so I could just play play around and try some ideas out. You know, because I used to code a little bit on the 64. I'm not, I'm not a programmer by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I used to dabble. And I thought, well, this is pretty cool. It's got a level editor, sprite editor. You can put a few things together quite quickly. And uh, I, I tried it out, and um, I thought, well, this, this is, this isn't too bad. And then uh, I don't, I can't remember how it came about. Whether it was a friend of mine or, or I just thought about it. But well, I thought, well, I'll just try and try and sell this game I'd created, which really was just, a, just a muck about. And um, I didn't realise at the time that everyone and their uncle was trying to do the same with shit up construction kit games. <laughs> so you just got the door slammed in your face as soon as they knew it was a suit game. You think, oh, no, 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 no. We want a proper game. Um, but eventually I got uh, Powerhouse, who I think were a subsidiary of CRL, I think. They, uh, they said yes. And, um, and that was, I, was, I was over the moon. So yeah. I, I, I got the check off of them, banked it very, very, very quickly, just as well, because they did go under. Um, and well, that money then was used to purchase me Amiga 1000, which I, which I still have down there oh, somewhere. You still got it. Beautiful. Ooh. Yeah, oh, down there somewhere. So it's not set up on a desk somewhere. It's... I, I, I would, but it, I need to do floppy drive for it. The floppy drive's oh, got a okay. dodgy button. So, um, but, so yes, but I, I do want to set it up because it's, it's such an iconic machine, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Icon- it is. I had a uh, souk, as the cool kids abbreviated it, shoot 'em up construction kit. Um, being a country boy, I made a game where you were a tractor that had to shoot zombie farm animals, um, okay. and it was terrible. But I'd never have dreamed of actually trying to get that published. So you must have either had a game you were quite confident in, or um, should we say a lot of swagger to have submitted it to, to try and get some money for that game. Well, I just wanted to get into the games industry, and I. You know, I, I was I was hoping to have got sort of my own stuff written and, and published, but this seemed like a kind of fast track way to try and just get something out there. And it was, I mean, you can play it now. I mean, it's 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 available online, and you can download the the image file. Um, What's it called? Uh, uh, it's called Battle Ball. Battle Ball. Okay. Battle Ball 54. And it, it it's not bad. I mean, I haven't played it for for a little while, but. Uh, it was just I just like the idea that you could profile ideas very very quickly with it, and you could try things out. And 
it, it, it served the purpose. I mean, I did hack the front end a little bit, but I've seen subsequent games where they've actually put new front ends on them and added lots of different music and things, which is amazing, you know, because the memory footprint, um, from what I recall, was, you know, you had to kind of work out where everything was. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was quite a, you know, quite a bit of a task to say, well, okay, I've got my graphics in there, my sprites, my tiles, and work out where you could actually put things in when you was, when you was hacking around with it. But yeah, I mean, I, I I think I was just lucky, to be honest. I really do. I think I just yeah. happened to go at the right time. Yeah. And they said, Do you think, was that with an objective to break into the games market as an artist specifically or as a programmer or just any way that you could? Um, I, I say I had a friend who was really, really good at programming and he taught me a lot of stuff like multiplexing and, and sprites in the board and all that sort of stuff. But I never really got my routines to the point where I put them all together in a game. I started... But I, so I was kind of like in this split of saying, well, do I go that way and, and put all my effort into being a programmer and learn, you know, learn everything I can about assembly language, or do I use my art skills and become an artist? And I kind of, I kind of not, it, it kind of kind of fell into the art side because it was something I just kind of got more of a kick and a buzz out of at the time, and the results were immediate. You know, when you program, you can spend like forever working on a routine and nobody knows a clue what you're doing mm. it's only after like you know many nights of blood sweat and tears that you actually see something so with the art it was an immediate kind of gratification like, yeah all those hours i put in you can see it so for me i, I was just happy just to get in and, and be offered work you know it was, it was great and, and battle ball gave me the opportunity because it got me an amiga 1000 which yeah. then as a as a creative machine it was just, it was the top dog of the day wasn't it? i mean it really was the, you know yeah yeah. Well, let's just pause on that Amiga 1000 for a moment because you know I'm a huge Amiga fan. Um, yeah. So was there something that specifically appealed to you as an artist in the Amiga 1000? Because I remember when they introduced it to great fanfare, there was Debbie Harry and there was Andy Warhol on the stage presenting it. So they were trying to pitch it to the creative market, which is you as a potential customer. So, um, you know, it must have been an exciting time for you to see that. It, it really was. I mean, I... I... I was a huge, huge fan of the arcade games, and I, I always tried to, when I was fiddling around with graphics on the 64, I would always try and get them to look like arcade graphics within the, you know, the restrictions of the, the chunky 64's graphic display. Um, but when I first saw the Amiga, and I think, I think I, the first time I saw one actually live or, or running was on Micro Live when Fred Harris did that, that, you know, that, that, that feature on it. And I actually recorded it. And I recorded it, and because um, my parents in their living room, they'd like a big TV and a big VCR. And I had it recorded, and I remember pausing, going back, pausing it, and going up to the screen and going, like, looking at <laughs> I mean, it was a VHS, so obviously the resolution was pretty pretty rubbish. But I remember looking and thinking, how many colours has this thing got? You know, And this is before I really knew what the machine could do. And I thought, I really, really want one of them. And, and, and I think, I mean, don't forget, we're going back to a time when, when there was a new machine announced, it was like, wow, what's this? What can this do? You know, what, what can I do with this? How much is it going to cost? You know, what, what, you know, there's all these questions that come into your head. And the Amiga was almost like a sensory overload <laughs> when you're looking at those kind of those things because you think, well, what, what, you know, this is like nothing I've seen before because we come from the 8-bit machines where they were, you know, they were great, but they were very limited. And all of a sudden you've got this machine which had like the, the famous, you know, King Tut mask bouncing around the screen you think wow that's yeah. that's and we've got the bouncing ball demo which is like well, the sound is incredible yeah. so for me it was like i had to have one you know i just had to have one was and, there anything uh, out there that was a close second or was it just amiga or nothing for you uh, for me it was amiga or nothing yeah. uh, I, I i don't i don't think i mean i was a commodore man so i i immediately honed in on anything commodore would announce you know if they brought out uh, another, you know, I mean, I got the Commodore 128, and which I really like. I really like, which I just wish they'd have enhanced a bit more on the 64 side of things. Um, but um, I, I, I just remember anything that Commodore would announce, I'd be like looking at it in, in great detail to say, right, okay, is that something that I, I want? Yeah. And the Amiga just did that. Yeah. You know, it just, yeah. There was nothing else around. I mean, the Atari ST was, was, it was almost up there, but it just didn't have the hardware chip. It didn't have the hardware, didn't it? The chips, the custom chips, it just didn't have any of that stuff. So you just had like a processor and a display. 
Um, and so although it could display, you know, nice graphics and it, it had a, a, a huge fan base, it's, for me, it just wasn't up there with the Amiga. Yeah, well, we'll try not to slip into the old Amiga versus Atari uh, no, playground no, 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 fight. No, 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 I've always <laughs> respect for the ST because, um, you know, it, 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 it gave me some royalties. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, sof- sof- software-wise, can you remember what software you were using to create your art? I remember using we had Deluxe Paint, we had Photon Paint. Um, there was a crazy one called Fantavision. I don't know if you remember that. That was like a vector one. Uh, you could do nice animations on, but what were you using to create the art for commercial games? Uh, I initially got D Paint Two, um, which I used. I, I I would just sit on in front of my my Amiga, and I would just create stuff and and just kind of learn how to do stuff in in D Paint, and that's where I kind of got into using the keyboard and the mouse together, you know, which a lot of pixel artists use. Um, and you have your right hand on your, on your mouse, left hand on the keyboard, and just use the keyboard shortcuts. So from that point on, I kind of really, really got into using d paint And there were a few other ones, like you mentioned, but I don't, I don't recall ever trying them out. I think um, I did later go into Brilliance, which was faster than d paint And commercially, you, you, you know, you want to turn out stuff quickly. And when you when you've got like, you know, um, a lot of work to do, even though you're you know, you're using the same software. If there's something that comes out that can offer a little bit more of a speed increase or does things a lot, slightly better, then you know, I'd always look at it. And Brilliance did that for me. Uh, and I used Brilliance. When did I start using Brilliance? I used that when we was doing Sensible. Uh, I think we, after I think Canonford had started, so it's about halfway through Canonford, I, I switched to using Brilliance. But up until that, that was just steep pain. Mm. But I can't say that the, the Brilliance got my attention because it used exactly the same keyboard shortcuts as D-Paint, which is a very, you know, very clever move on the developers because it immediately had a, a base audience that could just slot right in and you start using it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, things are the same today if you're using Adobe Photoshop. You've always got one hand on the keyboard on Control Alt and Shift. You know, you're always just a, a short reach away from copy, paste and all of the other shortcuts there. Um, yeah, it's interesting because... Uh, the software that you're talking about is software that we had available to us and the hardware. Um, the A1000 was a bit out of my price range, but I had an A500 when you know, they developed and cost cut the hardware. Um, and this is an industry that would go on to become the biggest ent- part of the entertainment industry in the world. Um, so we all had access to it and we all still do in the modern day on our desktop PCs, whether it's using downloading Unity um, you know, or any of the other packages that uh, modern developers use. But did you feel at the time like you were on the edge of something, like you were a pioneer uh, on part of a new industry in what you were doing? I I did, but um, I, in hindsight, I don't think I realised how big the Amiga was and, and, the, and, the, and the, the stuff we was doing. And I'm not just talking about Sensible, I'm talking about all the developers at that time because we was all doing... We was all pushing boundaries. Uh, I think that Amiga certainly just was a, was ahead of its time, you know. And I, I, I and I think that we was we were given this opportunity to work on something which would allow us to first time create arcade quality games on your home micro, and that's special because at the time, you know, the, the nearest you'd get to arcade games was to go to the arcades, you know. And if you was fortunate enough to actually own I don't know, like a super gun and actually own the PCBs and stuff, then you, you know, obviously you could, you could do that, but, or a cabinet. But most of the time it was literally just down to the arcade. So, so being able to work on a machine that, that allowed you to experiment, push things. I mean, an example, the Amiga had a dual playfield mode and, you know, you had two playfields of eight colors each and, you know, you could split the screen halfway down and increase the playfields and have a lovely, lovely parallax effect going in no time. It wasn't a lot of effort to, to do because the machine was, was set up to do that sort of stuff. So all of a sudden you've got this machine which, which can then say, well, hang on, I can see like a game in the arcades. I can create that in, on this Amiga machine, which you couldn't do on a 64. You could try, but it always looked like mm-hmm. a home, home micro port. A good example is like Marble Madness. I mean, that on the Amiga, if you put that next to the arcade, you could probably see some very slight differences, but they look the same. You know, um, so 
first of all, you, you, all of a sudden you've got this machine which can offer everything you could possibly want, but it's there now. You know, it's mm. like, well, you, you make it sound so you make it sound so easy, Stu, but you still had to get your head around things like bit planes and how that works. So. <laughs> That's true. I mean, that's true. I mean, it, I mean, I've still got the I've still got the reference manuals, the Amiga programming manuals, and um, they were a hard reading at times. But as an artist, I used to do I used to dabble in the coding on the Amiga as well, so I'd always have a have an idea of what what could be achieved. Yeah. So um, yeah, you're right. I mean, there was there was a learning curve, but it, the rewards were so so worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Take some credit, sir. Take some credit for your hard work. Um, so you 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 created your uh, your shoot 'em up construction kit game. You got your dream computer, and then before long, you were working at Sensible Software. So how did you get your foot in the door at Sensi? My foot in the door came from a um, a I think it was a weekly or biweekly uh, magazine. And it just had some editorial content and it had some adverts in the back. And right at the very back, they would always have, and I can't remember the name of the magazine. I, I wish I could remember it. I'll have to do a search at some time. And it had like job adverts from various developers and publishers. And I just saw this advert sensible. And I thought, wow, you know, could I, shall I have a go? Shall I just send some stuff in? And I ummed and awed, and I really didn't think I was good enough. I thought, no, oh, no, they're not going to want me, you know, I'm, I'm a nobody. I don't, you know, I'm just a fan who, who, who loves the games. So I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose, nothing at all. So I put together a, a portfolio disc. Uh, I'd already sent some of these discs out to various publishers and developers around London. And um, lo and behold, I got a, a, a letter back. I mean, bear in mind, this is the time where there was no email. So there was no internet, no email. So it was all done through the post. And um, I got this letter back from John saying, yeah, we'd like you, invite you in for an interview. So that was it. So we went up there for the interview and uh, had a great interview with the guys. And um, they said they let me know. And uh, I think it was, I don't think it was long before they did let me know. And it was literally that you've got the job, you know. And I think the letter, I've got the letter somewhere. Um, and it said something along the lines of, we're inviting you to work on some <laughs> hot games. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> and I thought, that's it. You know, that's it. You know, uh, And that was it, really. I was in. I was You're in. Really? And I, I I was panicking. I really panicked. I thought, how am I going to, you know, I've got, a, I've, I felt like I was blagging it, to be honest. I really did. <laughs> I don't know why, because, you know, the work got me through and, you know, if my work was rubbish, I wouldn't have got the job. But I always felt like I was blagging it. An element um, of imposter syndrome, perhaps. I think we all get it I to think, a degree, don't we? <laughs> 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 but no, no, but it was, it was, it was one of those moments in life where, where you, you think, wow, this is really happening. Yeah, yeah. And were you parachuted into a game that was in development, or did something start afresh when you came in? Um, I, I was the product I was brought in to work on was Cannon Fodder, but this was a time when Mirasoft were having problems, and they'd had uh, sensible had a deal with Mirasoft, and their the future of the company was in jeopardy at that time. So I was brought in, and Jules was brought in, and we was like, oh, we might actually be out of a job <laughs> as soon as we started. Oh. Um, because we were supposed to be working on cannon fodder, yeah. um, but that that soon got ironed out and we started. But I, I was brought in just as Wiz, Wiz Kid was being finished and Megalomania was being finished. Okay, okay. So the distinctive art style that Sensi had that was that had already been developed uh, to a degree before you came in in more in Megalomania than Wiz Kid. They had the little characters, didn't they? Um, yeah. And then. Did you have a lot of creative freedom at Sensible Software to experiment with ideas or were the schedules and the deadlines too tight for anything like that, do you think? Um, schedules and deadlines? What's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I did, yeah. I mean, I mean to, 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 to John and Chris, that to their credit, I mean, they did, you know, anybody who's taken on board, you did get the full creative freedom. As long as you was all, you know, you're working towards the same goal and it was all in the same direction. Yeah. Uh, and it fitted in with, with the way that the game was being developed. So, um, I mean, I, I came up with the look for cannon fodder. I came up with the style. Um, the, I mean, originally with the, the, the tile set, the graphics were going to be based on a 32 by 32 pixel tile set. That's what I initially did. That soon proved to be a non-starter because it was just too big. It, it wasn't going anywhere. So we decided to go down to 16 by 16. Um but uh, yeah, I mean, as so far as the, sorry to interrupt you. So, were the original cannon fodder 
soldier sprites were they larger as well or were they the same size just you just had a bigger background tile set yeah okay they were the same size. i mean i i, I mean john had done the graphics for megalomania and because it, and, and purely because we wanted to fit a lot of detail on the screen we just we just retained that kind of size sprite um so i, I went off and created some soldiers uh it wasn't the same size as the megalomania guys they were i think I can't remember if they were slightly bigger or slightly smaller, um, but I, 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 I'd created the sprites for California initially to be roughly the same sort of size as Megalomania, and I did a big sprite sheet with, with different colours and different styles of uniform. So, I mean, in that size pixels, you, you, you can't really get a lot of detail, and um, we just went through and picked out the ones that looked like they'd work. You know, I mean, originally we had blue uniforms and uh, green uniforms. We even had khaki. And, and kind of like desert uniforms. So, um, and then we narrowed that down, and we, we then got uh, got that in and, and, and got them working. But I mean, the tile set was the thing. Which I mean, I've got the graphics. I'm gonna I'll put them online at some point. The original 32 by 32 pixels are awful. The graphics they 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 really were rubbish. I mean, and I I was really panicking at the time. I was like, how am I going to pull this off? Because I'm, I'm with this, like, these really well-known developers who've had a lot of hits, and I, I'm expected to create the graphics for one of their games. And I'm like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? You know. <laughs> but then the thing is, then something happen, weird happens, and I'm sure a lot of artists have the same thing. When you start working on something, you kind of get into the zone, and you kind of like the whole of the outside world gets shut out, and you just, you're just focusing on what you're doing. You know, you're just there. And... Um, it soon as it kind of like rolls about and you, you get stuff churning it out and it all kind of comes together in the end. Yeah, well, it certainly did. You made a great job of cannon fodder. Um, and where would you say that your artistic prowess while you were at Sensible Software, where would you say that peaked? If you picked any game or any part of a game that we should go and look at to see peak Stu Cambridge, where should we look? Oh, um, I, I've, I've, I've always been very, very, very proud and pleased at the parallax sections in Cannon Fodder. Oh, that's between yeah. the levels with the helicopters yeah. flying across. The, the, yeah. the mission briefing, in, you know, the intro bit where you're flying to the to the location. I've always been pleased with those because I, I, I'm, a, I say I'm a big fan of the arcades and parallax scrolling to me is always like, always, it's always giving me a little, little, bit, of a, little bit of like a, a giggle. I think, oh, that's, that's really nice, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've always looked at that and think that's arcade. That's that's like the old arcade stuff. And I mean that goes back to as a kid, you know, and that's that's that stayed with me. That that kind of like memory of seeing arcade games. But for me, I'd say that was that was the, the bit that really kind of I pushed myself a bit with. Um, I was very happy with the uh, conversion we did for Megalomania and the Mega Drive because that was quite a task because the original Mega version was using full bitmap graphics. And as you know, with a Mega Drive, you've got tiny little eight by eight characters in a very limited space, using all sorts of tricks to kind of get more graphics out of the machine. Um, and Jules and myself kind of, we just worked so closely to try and get the, the Amiga version, you know, onto the Mega Drive, and so it wouldn't look like it's a dodgy pull. Mm. Uh, um, so that's another proud moment. But I mean, to be honest, I, I've always worked to my best ability. So whatever I do, I'll always push it as much as I can. You know, within the within the bounds of the time I've got, so um, most of it's most of it's been good. I mean, yeah. I've, I've, I can't particularly say. I mean, there's there's anything there that that would stand out heads and shoulders about anything else. You know, mm. it was all work that I was really pleased with. Well, Stu, um, speaking of pride, um, I want you to be proud of me for a moment because you are talking to the Retcon 2019 Sensible Soccer Champion. <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm actually in awe. Hang on a minute. One second. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Does it? Pac-Man, Pac-Man likes it as well. <laughs> Does it surprise you that uh, 27 years, yes, 27 years after its release, uh, that people are still playing games like Sensible Soccer and Cannon Fodder? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, because I'd never ever thought that we'd be in a position today where you can buy a machine for like fifty quid and buy and, and play basically the whole range of games from you know all your classic computers, consoles on one machine and on a little memory card. You know, um, you know, you can get a Pi, Raspberry Pi, and load it with emulators. And I saw the video you'd recently did with the the Mister. Yes. You know, and that, that was 
that's very that, that's I find it very interesting. No, because the game was was so loved at the time, and it sold bucket loads. I mean, it really did sell bucket loads. Um, so, but I, I do find it amazing that that it's 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 got such a huge fan base, you know, and it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I mean, I, I mean, what other you know games have that? Mm-hmm. They have that fan base, but are still feeding the whole thing. I mean, they're putting new data in, they're having tournaments. And yeah, sensible soccer, especially you know, with esports becoming such a big thing as well as it has been for a few years now, you know, it's it's uh, it's esports for us oldies as well, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Well, I'm not, well, I'm only 21, so I mean, you know, I, I just I just look a bit older than I am. But, uh, you <laughs> do you know. ever do you ever pick it up and have a game yourself every now and then? Um, I'd like to say, of course, but no, <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> I've got the. I've actually got the. Um, I've got the plug-in Mega Drive one. You know, I don't oh, saw yes. that. I've got that up there, which I picked up years ago. Um, but the Mega Drive version is is a good version. You know, that's a good version. If you haven't got the Amiga one, the Mega Drive, I would say, is probably the next best thing. The competition uh, that we did was on the Mega Drive, um, and I liked it because it splits out the buttons, so you've actually got a shoot button and a pass button, rather than that one button on the Amiga. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, Stu, it's been really nice chatting to you. We could talk for a lot, lot longer, but we already have on the Retro Island Diskettes uh, podcast. So um, anyone who's watching, I urge you to check the description, head over to my sister channel, Retro Island Diskettes, where we have these longer form interviews. Subscribe and you will see Stu arrive on that channel this week with his full interview. He's going to open uh, series two of the podcast. So um, thank you again, Stu. Um, thank you for your, your contribution to the games that we love and for taking the time to chat to us today. My pleasure. Always a pleasure, Neil. Always a pleasure. Okay, take care. Take care. See you later. If you enjoy my content and would like to toss a coin into the hat to support the cave, then check out patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers you can see on the screen now. Thank you for your support.